mighty Lord of life, creator of the heavens, the earth, the sea, the sky. And we believe in Jesus, the only Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary. Jesus suffered, was beaten, crucified, he died and he was buried into the darkest night. The third day rose victorious, ascended into heaven. Will one day come to judge us? The Church, one faith, one Lord of all, His kingdom We acknowledge Jesus Christ, the creator, redeemer, and Lord of all heaven and earth, and that we meet on the land of the Ghana people. Let's stand to sing, all glory be to Christ.
Uh, that uh, clip we played before the service started, I hadn't seen the whole way through that clip before. I didn't realise it had tongues in it. Yeah. I'm not sure how many, how many uh, sang along with the Latin or the, the Greek or the... I think German was in there as well. But. <clears throat> anyway, all nations together under Christ. There was a... Um, there was a referendum yesterday. <laughs> might, might have been uh, aware of that. Um, is it um, Winston Churchill said that uh, democracy is the worst form of government, apart from all the others? So a, as a form of government, does service very well, and uh, the referendum and its results are something for us to trust to Christ, who is Lord and, uh, and Redeemer of all nations. Um, but uh, what we do know is that, as the Bible tells us, through the gospel, God has brought all nations together in Christ. And uh, let me just read these few words for us from Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the, his the hostility between us, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting that hostility to death through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. And, uh, and so... At the beginning of God's purpose, when he called Abraham, and the end of his purpose, we read of in the book of Revelation, God's bringing all the families of the earth into his kingdom and the eternal worship of Christ. So because of the cross and faith in Christ, we are to work for that here in Australia, uh, reconciliation. Those words of Paul in Ephesians 2 he was referring to Israel and Gentiles, the Gentiles. Uh, by the way, that also means he was referring to Israel and Palestinians, Arabs. He's also speaking to Aboriginal Australia, non-Aboriginal Australia. Relates to all of us. And we, we're to work for that in faith. But, uh, you know, um, having had the, uh, a number of years living in Port Augusta and uh, making a number of friends, Aboriginal friends and uh, Aboriginal Christian friends. What I can say is the, the absolutely best, most practical thing we can do as Christians to work for reconciliation, find an Aboriginal person and, and be their friend. Make friends with them. And, and that's where it will start from and be practical. We're going to continue in worship now. Uh, this has all happened through Christ. What a beautiful name. Thanks. Nothing compares to this 
want heaven without us So Jesus, you Let's come before God, our Father, now with our prayers of confession. Let's pray. Almighty God, most merciful Father, you created us for life together. We confess that we have turned from your way we have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved one another as you commanded. We have been quick to claim our own rights, but careless of the rights of others. We have taken much and given little. Holy God, whose compassion never ends, we ask you to forgive us our sins and to blot out all our guilt, that we may know again the joy of your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, our Father, in great mercy, has given his son Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so by the authority of Christ, I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> love divine, all loves excelling. Let's stand together and sing.
It was a, was a pleasure last Sunday to, uh, with Catherine to visit our old stamping ground at Port Augusta and uh, catch up with the folks there and, uh, and worship with them. And uh, it was a pleasure to take uh, your greetings to the folks at Port Augusta. And uh, today I want to return their greeting and love uh, to you here too. And uh, they can actually kind of return it in person too, because we've got my good friend Graham Bull here with us today, one of our uh, visitors from time to time from Port Augusta, so um, it's great to have him with us. Um, as we mentioned before, there was a, there was a, uh, a referendum yesterday, uh, but of course, as uh, often happens, our hall here was a, uh, a, a voting booth, and... Um, Thank you to the folks from the congregation, many of you I know put in a lot of work to, uh, to run the uh, sausage sizzle and, and also some stalls there too. And uh, proceeds for those, um, for those uh, stalls go in part to one of the overseas mission uh, projects that our congregation is involved with. So thanks for everyone if you're involved in that. Um, someone came in this morning, was handed a little piece of paper and a pencil, and they said, well, I hope you're not going to ask me to write yes or no. <laughs> um, but uh, as uh, many of us would know, some of you might not, you might not have caught up with it, but part of our seven-week series, Generosity, uh, God's Radical Grace, Responding to God's Radical Grace in Community. It's really all about the generosity of God but we get to share in it. And so part of that series, uh, money is a small part of that, yet an important part. Uh, the most important part is the giving of our lives to the Father and to our neighbours in his, in his purpose. But uh, we had the last Sunday uh, of the series last Sunday and James preached to us on uh, uh, generosity and power. Um, and... Um, what we're doing today, including in our worship, a special thanksgiving offering. We've been thinking and praying about God's rich generosity to us and our response, the things we're thankful for and our response. And so as a part of the worship today, we've got a basket up the front and see we've already got some uh, goodies there that the one of the congregation wanted to bring along as a part of that. What we invited you to do was to write on a piece of paper, if you would like, the things you are thankful to God for. And you might have wanted to write there too something just of how you want to respond, maybe how you want to give. And uh, this is um, anonymous between you and God, but we want to invite you when we come to offering time for those who would like to come past the front of the church and this basket here, place both your offerings for today um, and your, uh, if you've got a piece of paper with your offering of thanksgiving on it, to place that in the basket as well as a symbolic gesture. Uh, any of you who uh, find that difficult or need or prefer to remain in your seats, do that. And we'll also bring around the offering bag for those of you who want to place your offerings in, in the offering bag, which can be your gifts or your, your piece of paper. So that will be, that'll be a, an act of worship as, as to how God's been working in our lives and where he's leading us in our response to his generosity. I'd also like to invite Linda to come and join me up the front here for a moment. Please come up, Linda. Um, in, in about the last three weeks, I think some of us might have noticed hanging on the walls in the entrance, a couple of, uh, a couple of banners, these two, and uh, they were um, Linda's handiwork and, and gift to the church. And uh, Linda, you might, whether, whether you want to comment on them, what they, uh, how they came about and what they mean for you. Okay. Good morning. Jonathan's invitation to speak about the banners really tested me because I don't like being up front. <laughs> oh, sorry. That better? Can yeah, you hear better? Um, yeah. Just as I said, I, Jonathan's invitation to speak about the banners really tested me because I don't like being up front with anything. 
I don't like being the centre of attention, so this is going to be short. Why did I make them? I've had the designs for quite some time now, and purchasing them initially was just because I liked them. However, on entering the church on a number of occasions, I've often thought to myself, the walls in the portico look really bare and uninviting. And then one day I was thinking that as I was walking in and a little small voice said, well, why don't you do something about it? So I did. Both banner verses mean a great deal to many, I'm sure, including me. The Lord's Prayer given to the disciples, I learned as a little girl. And it is sometimes the only prayer I can pray. The Lord's Prayer, sorry, the 23rd Psalm is my go-to Psalm when a trouble comes my way. I find it comforts me, and I'm sure that it does many others too. But there's also an important side of this story, and I hope she doesn't mind me mentioning this or sharing it. I was concerned that after making them, of handing them over, because I didn't want to upset Julia. She has made so many beautiful banners. Just look around you, you know, you can see them. But I prejudged her. And guess what? Julia was one of the first ones to get in touch with me and thank me for donating them. She sent me the most beautiful text. So Julia, I thank you for that. She taught me a valuable lesson. And thank you also to the many others who expressed their appreciation. Uh, I re really find it very humbling. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Right. Yes, that's right. Our church is adorned with many wonderful banners. We've got quite a stable of them out in the vestry, and they uh, change over in the, in the course of the year often. Julia and many others, too, have contributed to those. So they're all part of the gifts of God's people, the love of God's people, and we're, we're thankful for uh, all of that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to continue now in our prayers of intercession and uh, I will lead us in this time of prayer and um, we'll also have a, an open time for any members of the congregation if you would like to pray out loud to offer prayer please feel free to do that or pray silently in your own hearts and then I'll conclude this prayer time so let's let's come in prayer <clears throat> our dear God, our Father, Jesus has come and he has revealed to us the fullness of your mercy. And in your word, you not only invite us, you command us, come boldly to your throne of grace and, and voice our prayers, voice in prayer, the needs, all the needs that are known to us and the needs of our world. And so we, we do that before you now, Father. We open our hearts in prayer to you. Will open their hearts and pray for the people there. 
I thank you, Lord, for your love and grace upon them and your peace. In his precious name, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you. So would it be. Thank you. I don't know if it would be well needed. Wisdom and understanding of what peace means. Pray, Father, that their leadership will prevent a Middle East war that the world does not need. Heavenly Father, be with our government. Mm. Help them not to be finger pointing and blaming for bad things. Help the government and the opposition and all the people to move on to forgiveness and listening to all nations and working for the better of the world. Amen. Father, we pray for reconciliation wherever it is needed. Here in Australia, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians. In the Middle East, Father, between Israeli and Arab. We pray, Father, that the reconciling power and love of Christ will work and bring about the fulfilment of his purpose, the coming together of all families of the earth into the kingdom of Christ. But may we see that also here and now. Father, we pray for our nation, for our community, Golden Grove and surrounds. And we pray that you will fill us, your people, so full of the love of Christ that we overflow and we be a people holding out the love of Christ to our community, a light to our community. And we pray, Father, that your spirit and your love will be working across our community to draw those who don't know you to you, to reveal to them, Father, the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the purpose, the joy, the hope that is theirs too in Christ, that they may come and take hold of that. We, we pray that we'll see people doing that here in Golden Grove Church and across the churches of Adelaide and South Australia. Father, we think of all of those whom we know of in need within the congregation or across our community and families at this time. You know each and every one of them. You know what they're going through. May every one of them know that Christ is with them and that he is there 
shepherd, he is their redeemer, he is their Lord, that he has taken up their lives and all of their need in himself and he has acted in grace to meet all of that need and he now carries and keeps them and is bringing them to fulfilment in your purpose. And we pray, Father, in your great grace and goodness that you would also grant healing, health, reconciliation, new love, new faith, comfort, new provision where it's needed. Father, your grace may overflow and be seen and praised in these ways too. Father, we bring all of these prayers before you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come now to the time of uh, our Thanksgiving offering and uh, we're going to be singing during this time uh, the, the beautiful song of the, uh, the Gettys, um, Keith and Kristen Getty, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. So from, what, from when we start, feel free to come forward and as, you say, play, as we said before, place your offerings in the basket and then, uh, and then be able to return to your seats. And uh, we'll also we'll bring around the offering bag for anybody who would need to or would prefer to remain in their seats. So, my heart is filled with thankfulness as we bring our thanksgivings to God. <laughs> Let's pray in dedicating our offerings. Dear Father, we bring you ourselves. Father, your generosity in your Son, Jesus Christ, is overwhelming, blows our minds. 
And Father, it claims us, it woos us to love you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. And Father, truly seeing what you've done, what you've given, we cannot withhold anything from you. All that we are, all that we have. And so, Father, these thanksgiving, these gifts, and what we have written from our hearts, what we're thankful for from our hearts, and what we give of, of our hearts, we, we bring that to. Yes, Father, all in so many ways inadequate compared to the gift that you have given. But, Father, by your grace, you take up anything we offer in faith in Christ and you receive it, Father, as the most perfect and blessed gift that gives your heart joy. And so we pray, Father, that you will bless these offerings and bless us every day with continuing to offer ourselves and what we have. That we may see, Father, the kingdom of Christ in this place fill up to overflowing again and again and again to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have the, the uh, Bible reading now for this morning. Thank you, Ricard. Our Bible reading for this morning comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is the word of the Lord. Today, um, said marking the conclusion of the the series we've done on on God's generosity, uh, it's also a shift to a new series which is going to be happening over the next five weeks uh, about mission. And uh, you might have noticed a little while ago the little mission statement that's printed on the front of the Gazette changed from what it used to be. And uh, the new statement came out of some work that the Church Council did in the latter part of last year on uh, working on our mission vision here uh, at Golden Grove.
for the next five years and beyond. And so uh, what we want to do and what I want to do is to be able to share and unpack some of that vision for us as a congregation so that we can be renewed, all of us, in God's vision for our life and mission here in Golden Grove and the surrounding area. And uh, you'll notice if you look at that statement, it's, it's got five phrases in it. It says there that we are gospel-driven, connected, generous church family, mission-minded, outwardly focused. So in each of the next five weeks, we're going to be taking one of those phrases and, uh, and opening it up, developing it from the Bible, and uh, for that purpose of encouraging and renewing us in God's vision for us. So um, today, the first phrase, uh, our, our life and mission here at Golden Grove is to be gospel-driven gospel driven so uh, gospel that that word can be simply translated as good news and we would also understand it as the essential christian message and uh, driven well it's the driver it's got to be the engine that drives us and everything that we do so uh why has it got to be gospel driven and and how does it come to be and we're going to look at that this morning from our reading from Romans 1, particularly focused on verses 16 and 17, although we'll be looking at other parts of that passage. So and we're going, to, we're going to see this today, why and how we're to be gospel-driven by looking at, one, what the gospel is, two, what the gospel does, and three, how we must respond to the gospel. So firstly... Uh, what the gospel is. This is the briefest point, but nonetheless very important. Now, we might hear gospel, we might think, oh, that old thing, you know, the gospel, well, we know what that is, it's kind of old hat. Um, we, we can think of it as, um, you know, the oldest teaching of the church about the, the truth about Jesus Christ, or we might see it as sort of the Christian uh, theory or philosophy about life that we could weigh up and we could accept it or we could reject it. We could follow it or not. No. Uh, Paul says there it's not a teaching or philosophy. He says in verse 16, it is a power. A power. Power has effect. It does stuff. And he says it's the power of God. So if it's a power, uh, it's not just, you know, a theory we might, you know, think about and reject or accept. It's a power. It's real in our lives. That means it confronts us, could overcome us. It means we must respond to it. If it's a power that meets us, we would either have to wrestle with it or, or deal with it or accept it or run away from it. And it affects and changes us. It is the power of God, the same God who said, let there be light, heaven, earth, and there was. So that means we can't just shrug it off. It is God's truth, it's, it's uh, God's word, the word of, that we have in the Bible, it, it is his message, the Christian message, but in that truth, in that message, it's not just information, God is there, he's present in his word, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's acting, and so... Uh, Jeremiah 23, 29, God says, Is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock to pieces? Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 speaks of God's word being like rain, like waters, that waters the ground, it makes growth. It, uh, it produces grain, which produces bread, 
Uh, this is God's word that doesn't come back to him empty. It comes back to him full. It accomplishes, it prospers what it intends to do. Dina Gower is an Aboriginal woman from part of the Noongar country in the Perth suburb of Manning in Western Australia. And uh, she says that the Christian message is the driver of her life, the gospel. And she, with her husband Gary, have developed and run many community programs helping Aboriginal children and families, and they see that work as, what, as the work God has called them to. Uh, they also have done a lot of work focused on bringing together Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians and Christians. And uh, when she was young, Dina had been told the gospel many times by Aboriginal pastor Cedric Jacobs, and uh, she had resisted responding. But one night, the gospel powerfully reached into her life and totally changed everything through a quite shocking vision. She tells, one night in my dreams, this big lion was dragging me around the room, smacking me all over the place. I woke up in the morning and when Pastor Jacobs came there, I thought then that I needed to give my heart to the Lord. And me and my mate, one of my friends, we both gave our hearts to Jesus. God has just kept calling me after that and here I am. So that in, in the gospel, Jesus is also understood in the Bible as the lion who conquers us. Conquers our enemies, but in doing that, he conquers us. And at once, at the same time, he's the lion, but he's also the lamb who forgives and saves us. And all of that came powerfully to Dina at that moment. When the gospel, the word of God speaks to us, God is there and it does to and in us what it says. Many of us have experienced that. And yet, I know this because it's true of myself, we can forget. And we can end up just going back to treating the word of God, the gospels, oh, ho-hum, old hat. What the gospel is, a power. Secondly, what the gospel does. What does that power do? When verse 16, it says it's for salvation. Now, straight away, well, there's another, there's a very Christian-y religious word, isn't it? Salvation. Uh, might think, well, that's old hat and irrelevant too. So uh, people could think, well, you say I'm being saved from sin. Well, I don't believe in sin anymore. Uh, you say I'm saved for heaven. Well, I don't believe that either. But all religions and all worldviews strive for a form of salvation, including all secular people too, those who reject God and the supernatural and the eternal, they strive for a form of salvation. You know, people might think only in terms of here and now, but they have a concept of life's mess, all the stuff that messes up your life and your plans, and they have a gut instinct, I've got to escape that, I've got to avoid that like the plague. And they have a concept uh, of completeness, kind of like their version of heaven, completeness or fulfilment that they must get to. That's the most important thing they've got to get in life. So for a high-powered executive... Uh, that uh, completeness, that fulfilment might be to be smart, climb the corporate ladder, work the stock market, uh, buy out the company and get a mansion on, the Greek, on a Greek island to live in for the last 20 years of my life. But also, the little Aussie battler might think this way, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to do the right thing and I'll make it okay in the end and get a 20-year caravan holiday at the end of my life. You see, that's salvation for many. 
And so salvation is absolutely relevant to every human being. Now, Paul actually said there in our reading that all people actually know the truth of salvation. So he said there in, uh, in verses 19 and 20 of uh, Romans chapter 1, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that are made. So they are without excuse. Everyone knows it. And yet, he says, they know it and they don't know it. In uh, verses 18 and then 21 and 22, he speaks about this. They know the truth and yet... Um, he speaks of those who suppress the truth. For though they knew God, they did not honour him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. You see, people um, instinctively know the truth of salvation and yet suppress it and yet deny it. And so we grab all of these things in life that we think will be our salvation, but they're counterfeits. That's why so many try to, uh, who try to get that. You know, all these things that we think will save us end up confessing that their lives are empty and meaningless. And it's usually, especially those who try and get there the quickest, you know, the, the high flyers get to a point and they say, they've got everything, but they're empty. We've got what I thought would save me, but I'm empty. And, and we can do that on the little Aussie battler level. Oh, I thought I've done the right thing. I worked hard. I thought I'd get oh, empty in the end. Uh, now, I know there's a stack of folks in the congregation who are uh, caravanners, uh, so I should say there's nothing wrong with a caravan holiday, by the way. The problem is if we think it is salvation. So let me tell you about the big salvation that people are really striving for but don't know it or deny it. And uh, want to just pick up on, quickly or briefly on uh, three important parts of salvation. So let's call them A, B and C. So part A of salvation, Paul speaks here, verse 17, righteousness, to have a righteousness of God. And uh, righteousness, well there again, it's another Christian-y religious word, isn't it? That uh, People might think it's uh, somehow irrelevant, but again, no, it's actually talking about a reality that every person on the planet knows. Because being um, righteous just means being in the right. It means being in good standing, having no depths, being acceptable, uh, no one else having anything against us. And that's what every person wants every moment of their lives to be in that place of being in the right, being right, okay. What is your gut reaction whenever someone accuses you of wrong? What's your gut reaction? Defensive. Defensive. You justify yourself, like I do. You see, we, we instinctively know I've got to be in the right. Being right is essential to my well-being and to uh, all my relationships and to things going well. But if God created us for a relationship with him, who do we ultimately have to be right with? It's got to be him, God. And so again, you see this compulsion that every human being has to be in the right is, is actually telling us that every person instinctively knows this truth. They, they, they want to be right with God, but they suppress it. So in all of our attempts to justify ourselves, 
we're actually hungering to be declared, declared justified by God. But here's a truth. None of us can justify ourselves. That's why whenever we try to do it, we fail and we get ourselves into more trouble. And you see, this brings us to part B of salvation. It, righteousness has to be revealed. The righteousness of God, Paul says, it belongs to God. The Bible says that only God is righteous and holy. And in the Bible, therefore, anything it says about human beings being holy, it only comes from them belonging to God. God giving them his holiness, being in relationship with God, his holiness rubbing off on them. So that's why I said, Paul says, righteousness has got to be revealed to us, God's righteousness. It's got to be shown to us. We can't find it or, and we can't develop it ourselves. And so it's got to be revealed. God speaks it to us, his word, his gospel but what did we see his gospel was before? It's a power. And it does to and in us what it says. So that means God speaks righteousness into you and me through his word. It's a gift of the gospel. How can that be? How can righteousness be a gift that God takes and he gives to us? Well, in verse 3 of chapter 1 in Romans, Paul tells us the gospel is all about the Son. Jesus Christ. It's about who he is, what he's done, especially his death on the cross for the world and for us. What happened there in Jesus' death on the cross, Paul tells us in another place, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All of our failures, our sins, our brokenness were paid for, cancelled and forgiven on the cross. Which brings me briefly to salvation part C. It's about righteousness, it's got to be revealed. And part C, this is only the half of it, what God saves us from, because it's also just as much about what he saves us into. That's a vital thing for us to see. We're not just saved from sin. We are saved into an entirely new life and state. It's not just that we're not sinners anymore. It also means that we are declared and made righteous, holy, God's true glorious children whom he delights in. We are righteous people. Yes, we're sinners and failures. Yet by relationship with God through faith in Christ, all of his righteousness is ours. We might say, well, I don't look or feel too, uh, too righteous. So the God who said, let there be light and there was, says it of you. He declares that is your status. So we are are righteous people by God's own declaration. That's how God thinks about you. That's how he feels about you. And we have got to believe and know and feel that or we don't fully have the gospel, the good news. And we all can just keep hearing it in God's word and trusting it. Third point, what the gospel is, what the gospel does, how we must respond to the gospel. Well, if this is declared truth by the power of God, what else can you do but acknowledge it and accept it and receive it by faith, believe it? So Paul says there in verse 16, it is to everyone who has faith. So what that means is 
It is 100% God's power, action and doing. Which means we can contribute to it 0%. It's 100% grace. It's 100% gift and so all that's left to us to do is to receive it. And so that means it's open to all, as Paul says there, for all who have faith. Doesn't matter what race, culture, subculture, uh, whoever they are, whatever they've done. But we must receive it. Which means by faith, that means trusting it with all of our heart and life. And it includes repentance as well. Uh, acknowledging our sin and our need and turning to God. We must receive it. Greatest Christmas present in the world will give you no joy whatsoever if you leave it under the tree unwrapped. Got to unwrap it. Got to take hold of it. And as Christians, we must continue believing this. You know, we can be Christian and yet not fully believe that salvation is 100% God's grace and power. We can be living as Christians and actually relying on our own goodness. And so we can be full of pride, expecting congratulations from others and God, looking down on others. And what we're actually doing is being self-saviors. We're saving, trying to save our own lives rather than trusting in God's true salvation. But just to, to conclude very importantly, this is just the start of a lifelong transforming adventure. We've been given a whole brand new life. We are now the righteous children of God and so we've got a whole new brand new life to live. So let's live it. You see, 100% grace does not mean 0% us. No, it actually means the opposite because Jesus makes you and me participate 100% in his life and in everything that he's doing in the world. And so what that means is 100% grace actually means 100% us because Jesus catches us up and involves us in everything that he's about. Live life in the full action of Christ. That's what we do by faith. We may not look and feel a whole lot like fully righteous people, but as we believe and live in the gospel and with the power of the Holy Spirit, we may and we will look and feel more and more like it all the time. Paul says in another place, God transforms us from one degree of glory into another. Big changes are happening and going to happen in your life and mine. You see, by faith, we live up to the truth and what we find is that we become more and more true ourselves. Someone defined faith like this, just live as though everything God says in his word is true. Live just as though it is and you'll find it to be true. We live up to the truth. We live into it. And, you know, this is about the whole creation as well. Paul said he wants the gospel to get a harvest everywhere he goes, he says, including amongst the barbarians. So even hope for us Aussies. But for every person in Golden Grove and surrounds are included in that. Who do we meet? Who do you and I meet every day of our lives? And this gospel, this good news is so good, we will have to want to tell everybody. People suppress, they resist the truth tooth and nail, as Paul tells us there, but the power of the gospel can melt that hardness in an instant. It did me. 
And you know, by this, what is happening is that God's making a new reconciled community of his people, a genuinely loving human community that ultimately all families of the earth will come into. How could that impact Aboriginal, non-Aboriginal relations in Australia? How could that even impact Israel and Palestine? We cry and pray for them. And not just all people, creation itself. Jesus' saving action is so great, ultimately there must be a new, healed, transfigured heaven and earth. And we act in hope toward that renewal now. Our mission, our life at Golden Grove Church is gospel-driven. Let's live more and more as though it is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we confess to you with sorrow how we often forget and don't see the incredible life-giving power, the hope-giving power, the joy-giving power of your gospel. Remind us of it. Speak it to us again today and every day. And renew us in it, Father. Take your power that is in the gospel and put it in us. Put it on fire within us. And so, Father, may your gospel power be our engine, our driver. And so, Father, make us a people who hold out your gospel to everyone around us in our community and draw them to that light that they too will be your children. Come into your kingdom, be a part of your family. That is your heart's desire. May it be so in us, Father, and in this place. Amen. Thank you, uh, David, for sharing that, and we, we, we hold that in prayer uh, before God can confirm that. He certainly wants to speak to all of us, and uh, maybe to some of us in particular ways too. I'm going to sing a song. Uh, this will, um, will probably be, uh, for quite a few of us, a new one. Um, this is a song called, about everything we've just been speaking about, Rescuer, Jesus, our Rescuer. And it's a song from the uh, Irish Christian group, Wren Collective. And so um, we're going to stand together and sing it. It's... Um, it's uh, Wren Collective, it's got, it features the cracking voice of Chris, their lead singer, and uh, gets a bit rowdy at points, so gird your loins, uh, but great words, great song. So let's stand together and sing Rescuer. He's a Good news for the shame. There is good news for the world who walked away. There is good news for the doubter. The one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our
We can remain standing for our benediction. It comes from 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us this day and stay with us forever. Amen. Uh, Following the service, you're all invited for morning tea. And uh, if anybody would like prayer for healing or any other need, there'll be somebody can meet with you at the front of the church. And our benediction song is, May the Feet of God Walk with you. Thank you.